Welcome back, Mindsetters. I hope you guys are having a nice, snuggly, cuddly June 16 and you guys know exactly what it's about. You're at the right place for your good June 16 today. So I hope you're going to enjoy us as much as we enjoy you. Asam, we're ready for you. Take it away. Thank you, Katleho. Welcome, uh, Mindsetters. Uh, we were busy the last time with paper one meiosis and we take it from there. Just before we actually go to the question, just a simple explanation on the last thing that we did, and that was polyploidy. Poly meaning many, ploidy meaning the number of chromosomes. Polyploidy is a condition, people, when cells in a particular organism, all the cells, have more than two sets of chromosomes. So we have a situation where during meiosis, if the chromosomes do not separate, mainly during anaphase, if this happens, then obviously one of the gametes would have an extra set of chromosomes, meaning it would be diploid instead of haploid. That means 2n instead of n. Now we know from our study of meiosis that when gametes are produced, uh, the number of chromosomes is usually reduced to half so that when these gametes come together during fertilization, uh, then the individual that is formed from there would have the full complement of chromosomes. However, in this particular case, when these chromosomes do not separate, a particular gamete would have a double. Now, if this particular sperm or egg fuses with another gamete, uh, then 2 plus 1 would give you 3N, triploid. And if this in turn continues, or if two of those gametes fuse with each other, you'll get tetraploid. And so on, we can go on. In that way, we're saying uh, that this particular organism has more than two sets of the chromosome number, and therefore it's polyploid. It's mainly use, um, used in the agricultural industry with plants. We find many plants that are polyploid. Reason being, uh, they have larger flowers, larger uh, fruit, so in other words, that's better for industry. Also, they become drought resistant, again, good for industry, so that they do not lose crops in that way. And we get many seedless varieties, grapes that are seedless, watermelon that are seedless. These are all examples of polyploid organisms. We now move on to the questions for today. And the first one on the board is a diagram here, it says study the following diagram and answer the questions that follow. This particular diagram tells you clearly at the bottom, it is a karyotype of a person. Notice the karyotype diagram, it shows you uh, the setup of, or you can say it's a map of the chromosomes in uh, the autosomes. In this case here, or rather the somatic cells I should say. In this case, you can see there's pair 1 right up to pair 23. In humans, obviously, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We have 46 altogether, so therefore we had 23 pairs. So you need to look at this diagram clearly and see what is happening, and then we move to the questions. And as we go through the questions, we would be able to understand how this diagram actually works. The first question given there is this the karyotype of a male or a female? Male or female? Now, to understand or to determine the sex of an individual from a karyotype, we only have to look at one set of chromosomes, and this is pair number 23. In this particular instance, you can clearly see that pair number 23 are identical, they look the same. You're not getting one taller and one shorter. And yes, people, don't confuse uh, these things here for X's. Many of you think that these are X's. These are not X's. They represent chromosomes. So in this particular case, we look at 23. The two X chromosomes are identical, and therefore this is a female. If for some reason these chromosomes were drawn, something to that effect, and one small one there, then you know, because what many learners misunderstand is when they see this here that looks like an X, they think that that's two X chromosomes. You must not look at the letter X in this particular case. 
because that's not the answer. These are not X's, these are chromosomes. So you've got to look at the size of the chromosome. If they are of the same size, that means there are two X chromosomes. If they are of different size, like these two here, then one is an X and one is a Y. And in that case, it would be a male. Okay, I've given you the reason already. Give a reason for your answer because this particular in individual has two X chromosomes. How many chromosomes does this person have? Now, this, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just need to know simple arithmetic and how to count. If you look right across here for a start, you can do it individually, one, two, three, four, that would take very long. But if you look across here, there are 23 sets. And most of them have two per set. And 23 times two is 46. But, wait a minute, set number 21 has one extra there. It doesn't have two, it has three. So that's plus one. So this particular individual has 47 chromosomes. Name the genetic disorder that this person has. Again, back to the diagram. Remember, all our questions are related to this diagram, and therefore we need to look at this diagram every time we are working. Now, look at this particular case. This person has an extra chromosome here by chromosome number 21, and this is prescribed in your curriculum, and you know that if a person has an extra chromosome, particularly on chromosome set number 21, this person suffers from Down's syndrome. So our answer there is Down's syndrome. And let's just go back to the diagram. Just clearly just to understand what we have to know in this diagram again in the future. Number one, there are 23 sets. The 23rd set deals with the sex of the individual. Look out especially at number 21 to see if there are only two chromosomes or there are three. If there are two, the person is considered normal. If uh, there are two, uh, three there on chromosome set number 21, uh, then obviously this person is suffering from Down syndrome. You are also required to know the symptoms of Down syndrome as well. Okay, we move on to question number seven. And now, people, we move from meiosis to genetics. So you need to understand this section well before you can answer these questions. Just a handy uh, piece of advice. Uh, remember always that you need to know the terminology to be able to solve these problems. And like any problem, uh, the more you practice the problem, the easier it will become to solve the problem. The more questions you look at in this particular section, uh, the better it's going to be long term. Now this one here is a very clear diagram that gives us, study the diagrams below and show some that show breeding experiments on mice. Single pair of alleles showing complete dominance, clue. First clue there, complete dominance controls coat color, white or gray in these mice. Now they're giving you the diagram and they're showing you this, this set of mice, they mated and all the offspring are gray. All right, uh, this two here, they also mated and they have all gray uh, offspring. And the last two there have some white offspring and some gray offspring as well. So there's a diagram. Instead of giving you a problem in words, they simply put it in a diagram so you can see uh, the, what's happening. But now they didn't mention anything about homozygous, heterozygous, genotype, phenotype. Now these are the words uh, in your toolbox that you've got to carry with you when you're answering these questions. The first one says, state which sex chromosomes would be present in the gametes of parent mouse 2 and mouse 3. Let's go back up. Mouse 3 and mouse 4. Am I right? Mouse 2 and 3, sorry. So we are looking at that one and that one. This is a male and that's a female. And from the question that we just dealt with just now, Obviously, uh, this one here is a male, so he would have X, Y. Remember, the Y 
determines maleness. If the Y chromosome is absent, uh, then the organism would be a female. It has to be X, Y. If it's X, X, then it's a female. So that would get obviously give us the answer to this one, X, X. That is the sex chromosome. Remember when they're talking about sex chromosome, it's either XX or XY. Nothing else. Okay? The next one says, if mice 3 and 4 had a second set of offspring, what is the percentage chance that the first mouse was, would be a female? Now that's an interesting question, and it comes up often in the papers. And we need to look at this very carefully. I'm not going to do the whole setup because we're going to look at the setup just now again. So I'm just going to look at maleness and femaleness. Remember that chromosomes that control that are the XX and the XY. So this would be the mother and that would be the father. If we then put that in a Punnett square, I'm skipping all the steps of gay meets and the rest of it. We're going straight to the XX, keep what's on the left on the left, whatever is on the right on the top, easier to work with. XX, XX again, XY, XY. So what does this particular panel square tell us? It tells us that every time fertilization takes place, there's a 50% chance being male and an equal chance being female. So whenever they ask you this question, the answer will remain the same. Whether these mice had 1,548 offspring, and they're asking you about the next one, whether they had 2 million offspring, wow, then too, the answer would be the same. The answer will always be 50%. Which of the parents, one, two, three, or four, is likely to be homozygous dominant for coat color? Which of the parents, mice one, two, three, or four, is likely to be homozygous? Now, guys, let's understand. Homozygous means, first of all, that the gene and its allele are identical. So, in other words, if the gene is coding for gray coat color, then the allele, that's its partner, must also code for gray color. And the, uh, the other side of this one, another term, is heterozygous. Heterozygous. Here, the gene and its allele are different. In this example, if the gene is coding for gray, coding for gray coat, uh, then its allele is coding for white coat. That's what we need to understand here. Now they want to know which one is homozygous for the dominant color. First of all, nobody told us in this diagram which is the dominant color. We needed to work that out. And to work it out, we need to look at the diagram. Look at this particular cross in the first place. In this particular cross, gray mouse, white mouse, all the offspring are gray. Then we took two gray mice and we get a similar setup there as well. Now that tells us an important thing, that gray is probably dominant. And obviously it can't be mouse number one. So we take out that one from the equation. We obviously strike out mice, mouse number four. So it leaves us with two and three. Now look at the offspring of two, wherever two had a cross. In this instance, all gray. In this instance, all gray. But with three, in this instance, it gave us all gray. But in this instance, some white offspring came out. So obviously, gray cannot be homozygous for, uh, I'm sorry, mouse three cannot be homozygous for gray. So it can only be mouse number two. The answer would be mouse number two. Please understand, not the answer, but the reasoning behind how we got to this answer. That's the important part. Obviously, in this year, you play the game of elimination. You want to know for gray coat color. So obviously, the white ones are out. They're out of this equation. And it leaves us with these two. We look at this one here. In all instances, it's giving us gray. And that one, on the other hand, gave us gray and white. So most probably, Mouse number two is 
homozygous for the dominant color. Then they say, state why mouse 3 can only be heterozygous for coat color. Now, if you worked out this answer here, then this answer becomes obvious. Why? Let's go back. When we looked at these mice and their offspring, we found that mouse 3 had gray and white offspring. Because it has gray and white, it would necessitate uh, that mouse to have a characteristic for white. Remember, the offspring get their two alleles, one from the mother and one from the father. That one is obvious. The white is already there. But if this one contributed the gray factor, the gray alien, the dominant alien, uh, then this is the result. In other words, if you use letters, this would be G, G. If we use gray for dominant and small, uh, sorry, capital G for dominant and small g for a recessive. And uh, these ones would be G, G, as you can see there. So obviously, why are we saying that this had to be heterozygous? Because this particular parent had both gray offspring and white offspring. So this particular female would have had to have uh, the recessive characteristic which she passed on to the offspring. Time for a quick break. Guys, I know that some of you have even said that you're really enjoying this lesson and I know that you are. Take everything down, take everything in and make sure that you're refreshed and ready after this quick break.